Uh, our next speaker um, is Jorgo Hoshens from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, he's a PhD candidate at Torberg University in the Department of Econometrics and uh, Operations Research. And he's also a researcher at APG Asset Management. I think I'm right in saying that that's a big pension fund in the Netherlands. His PhD research project is behavioral biases and individual heterogeneity in pensions, household asset liability management. Um, and he's going to talk with us tonight about measuring risk and time prevalence during the emergence of the COVID-19 crisis and its relationships to investment behavior. So over to you, Jorgo. Thank you, uh, John, for this kind introduction. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Yes. Great. Um, so for me, it's uh, it's good morning. So also on my behalf, uh, thank you uh, for uh, being at this uh, paper presentation about uh, preferences, disposition effect and COVID-19. So this work is uh, co-authored with uh, Marike Knoef uh, from uh, Netspar. Um, and she will also join this uh, session a bit later. Uh, it's still a working paper. So all questions and feedback uh, is more than welcome. Um, so what was the original motivation for this, pa uh, this paper? It's a bit different than that of uh, Michael, but um, we uh, initially wanted to measure uh, risk and time preferences and biases. Um, and uh, given that we know, for example, how risk aversion looks like, patients, present bias, um, well, we can understand and improve savings and investment uh, decisions from a, a pension uh, fund participant uh, point of view. So uh, the idea was uh, if we assess the heterogeneity of uh, these preferences in a, a large representative sample uh, for the Netherlands, we might perhaps improve choice architecture, communication and asset allocation. Yeah, so uh, as an example, risk aversion uh, of a participant is, is a, a crucial input for the asset allocation uh, decision if we think about the standard uh, Merton uh, solution, for example, in a life cycle setting. Uh, but then uh, actually the COVID-19 uh, crisis happened and the survey that we planned to do uh, actually, uh, well, um, happened uh, to be during the emergence of the COVID-19 crisis in the Netherlands. So during uh, March uh, uh, this year. So then we changed our question and now our key question is, are preferences and investment behavior stable throughout time? So the first thing we do is uh, we measure uh, uh, five preferences, risk aversion, patience, present bias, probability weighting, and trust. Uh, trust specifically in insurance companies. Uh, and we also know something about these preferences uh, uh, from the literature. Yeah. So for example, there's a very recent paper from uh, uh, Shahsat and the co-authors. Uh, uh, they measure risk aversion in Wuhan and they find that during the uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, risk tolerance increased. Yeah, so risk aversion decreased. Secondly, we measure investment behavior. And very specifically, we measure uh, a strong anom uh, anomaly in the uh, finance literature, namely the disposition effect. Yeah, so we know that individual investors tend to hold uh, losing stocks too long compared to winning stocks. Yeah, so stated differently, losses are realized less than gains. And this effect is, is uh, frequently assumed to be uh, constant in the literature. And we try to shed some uh, light on this, whether this uh, holds true uh, during a, a, a crisis. So to give uh, somewhat more uh, intuition, um, this is a, a graph from a, a shield back Horace in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, where you see on the horizontal axis H, and you see that risk aversion increases uh, over the life cycle. And then in orange, there are some temporary fluctuations, and there might also be an exogenous shock to risk aversion. And uh, well, in this paper, we try to see uh, what happened with risk aversion uh, during COVID-19. To give even more intuition, this is a, a, a graph from the Netherlands Institute for Social Research. And on the horizontal axis, it shows time, yeah, 2008 to uh, 2020. So each quarter, 
uh, this institute uh, measures trust in institutions in the Netherlands. So they uh, uh, measure it in the administration of justice, uh, the parliament and the government, newspapers, televisions, labor unions and big corporations. And you see that during March 2020, also the period where we did uh, our survey, there's a huge increase in trust in, in uh, these uh, institutions. And I come back to that a bit later, but we uh, make exactly the same finding that people have an uh, increase in trust in uh, um, insurance companies during uh, periods of stress. So given this intuition, I, I turn to uh, the key results of our paper. Um, so the first question that we uh, uh, ask ourselves is, uh, okay, are risk and time preferences uh, uh, stable during the emergence of the COVID-19 crisis? So we find that present bias and impatience increase uh, during this period. Risk aversion decreases. So uh, the uh, uh, participants in our sample, they become more risk tolerant. And we also find in line with the previous picture that tr uh, trust in insurers uh, increases. Then secondly, we measure this investment behavior also by means of an experiment. That's also how we measured the preferences. Um, and we observe a very strong cross-sectional disposition effect. So given the uh, full sample of March, we find that the individual investors, which are households, Dutch households in our case, are indeed subject to this disposition effect. Yeah, so they hold on to losing stocks too long and they sell winners too quickly. Moreover, we make the finding that this disposition effect is not constant throughout the month March. Namely, we find that it actually increases as the uh, COVID-19 crisis unfolds uh, itself uh, further in, in the Netherlands. And the third question is, okay, what's then the relation between preferences and trading behavior that's still work in progress? Um, and uh, well, this month, so December, we do a uh, follow-up survey uh, to shed some more light on this and also on the previous two questions. So uh, a few months later, I can uh, come back to that point. So how uh, um, does COVID-19 and its emergence look like in the Netherlands? So, so to give you a brief background, so um, it actually uh, started at the beginning of March here in the Netherlands and uh, at March the 6th, there was the first death. And um, you see that during the first few weeks, there were not so many cases, but when uh, uh, March started to, uh, 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 well, unravel itself, the cases per day increased quite drastically. Yeah, so at March the 15th, the uh, government took some very abrupt national measures. Uh, so they closed uh, all the bars and schools, which was quite surprising. I remember it quite clearly. It was uh, 4 p.m. on a Sunday and 6 p.m. on a Sunday, they, uh, closed everything. And then uh, the 23rd of March, our so-called intelligent lockdown started. Yeah, so these two dates are also reflected in our results and I come back to that a few slides later. Because what do we do? So uh, first of all, we simultaneously, so that, that's well, uh, I would say an improvement also to the literature, we simultaneously measure risk and time preferences. Yeah, so we measure risk aversion, which we, uh, is a classical input, for example, for the optimal asset allocation. We measure probability weighting, this S-shaped probability weighting from Kahneman and Tversky. So these are the risk preferences. And then we measure the time preferences. So present bias, whether uh, participants overvalue the present or not, and we measure classical discount rates. And the method we use is the convex time budget method from the uh, American Economic Review of uh, Andreoni and Spranger in 2012. Secondly, um, so that's the uh, uh, second part also of our survey, we measure individual trading behavior and specifically we measure this disposition effect. And there we use uh, the paper of uh, Ploner from uh, 2017, where there are a few simple four uh, uh, risky investment tasks uh, to uh, check whether an individual is prone to the disposition effect. So we have a sample of uh, nearly 2000 participants and for the disposition effect, we have nearly 300 uh, participants and uh, we invited the ages between 40 and 70. 
So this is the uh, decision screen for the first part where we uh, elicit uh, the uh, preferences. So uh, the participants are hypothetically giving uh, 10,000 euros and they have to allocate this 10,000 euros between today and those euros in our case are paid with certainty and um, they can allocate any amount to today and also any amount to, to later, one year later in this case, um, and they also receive um, that uh, amount with certainty. Yeah, so for example, I put uh, zero euros in all the columns here, but you can also uh, allocate, for example, say 2,000 euros to today and then 8,000 euros in this case, uh, one year later. And then we have four scenarios. Yeah, so per scenario, the interest rate is different. So here there's no interest rate and here there is a substantial interest rate and participants faced uh, five of these decision screens. And um, therefore we have 20 questions. Yeah, so we have 20 answers how participants want to allocate uh, money between today and later. And the uh, sensitivity in the interest rates is going to uh, identify the risk aversion and uh, the time delays are going to identify present bias and um, patients. And the certainty is going to identify the uh, S-shaped probability weighting of prospect theory. So um, I'm, I'm going to do this uh, briefly, but we assume that participants then maximize this uh, problem when they answer uh, the questions. Yeah, so we have a standard CRA utility function where gamma indicates the risk aversion and participants receive utility, which we call CT. So that's the amount allocated to today. Um, and they receive also utility from uh, CT plus K. That's the amount allocated to, uh, for example, one year later. So could be 10,000 euros, uh, including interest or not. Um, they receive utility over that. Some of the payments are received with uh, uh, uncertainty. So in that case, uh, so that's called P, they don't receive C, they only uh, consume background income W. Uh, and pi P is the subjective probability and P is the uh, objective probability, sorry. And then we have, of course, the discounting. Yeah, so payments today uh, are discounted only with delta to the power t, and discount uh, and uh, payments after today are discounted with an additional present bias factor beta, which we call this uh, well present biased or quasi hyperbolic discounting from Leibniz uh, from uh, 1997. If we solve this problem, which is not too difficult, then we get an uh, equation which we can estimate very conveniently uh, using, for example, OLS or also uh, uh, Tobit uh, regressions. So that's what I do uh, here. So these are the uh, uh, main findings. So uh, these are the cross-sectional preferences. Uh, and then I come to the time series. So we find the present bias factor equal to one. So that implies that uh, at least Dutch participants or households um, are not prone to present bias. So they uh, do not overvalue the present. Yeah, so they are exponential discounters, so to say, and very time consistent. But note, uh, as I also said on the introduction slide, that there is quite a large uh, heterogeneity in this uh, uh, preference parameter. We also estimated the discount factor and to make that a bit more easy, I also show the annual discount rate. So we uh, find that participants discount with 8% per year, which is a, um, well, I would say also a surprising finding in the sense that this uh, discount rate is smaller than many of the other discount rates in the experimental literature. It's not uncommon to find discount rates of 50% or higher per year. We find a risk aversion parameter of a half, um, which indicates that participants are risk averse. And we find a probability weighting parameter strictly larger than one that indicates in line with the S-shaped probability weighting that participants underweight high probabilities. So if the objective probability is 50%, participants perceive that as 40% of getting a gain. Um, I skip that for now. Um, then we go to the preferences throughout the MOND 
uh, of March. Yeah, so how do these preferences evolve uh, as a result of the uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis? So as a dependent variable, I take the present bias factor, the discount factor, which make up the time preferences, and I take the risk aversion gamma. These are simple, ordinary least squares uh, estimates. So the uh, weak dummies uh, uh, indicate the week of March, and you see that towards the end of March, especially week three and four, when there were the abrupt measures, national measures, and also uh, when there was the um, um, intelligent lockdown, you see that participants become more present biased, given by the negative sign, it's not only statistically significant, but also economically, and they also become more impatient. And for risk aversion, we make the same observation, risk aversion decreases. Then I come to the trust, because we also measure trust in insurance companies, and we make the same observation in line with the, uh, social, uh, uh, the Institute for uh, Social Research in the Netherlands. Uh, towards the end of March, so you see that the coefficients increase, so these are first of all po positive and they uh, increase, and uh, during week four of March, you see that the uh, increase, uh, that there is an increase in trust in insurance companies. So that was the uh, first part, the preference part, uh, and then I come very briefly to the uh, investment part. So that's the uh, uh, second section of our uh, survey. So we are now going to measure uh, investment behavior. Yeah, so remember that we use the um, setting of Ploner. Again, we give participants 10,000 euros um, and they are going to invest this 10,000 euros in product A or B. Um, Jogo, five minutes. Yeah, thank you, John. They are going to invest this 10,000 euros in product A or B. Uh, and we are going to cost a coin or uh, to toss a coin, sorry, if it lands heads, product A gains, and if it uh, lands tails, product A lo uh, loses, and product B is exactly the, the inverse. Yeah, so they choose uh, between A or B, and then either row A happens or uh, row B. Yeah, so suppose that the uh, coin toss uh, was heads and the participant chose uh, product A, then uh, he gains 3,000 euros. And now comes the crucial question, given that the participant gained 3,000 euros, does he want to sell instantly his investment for 30,000 euros or hold on to your investment and do a next coin toss next year? Yeah, so that's exactly the idea of the disposition effect. If you had gains, do you want to sell or do you want to hold? So the results are shown over here. So remember the definition uh, of the disposition effect, losses are realized less than gains. Stated differently, you hold on to losers more often than to gains. We have four prospects, yeah, so the uh, decision screen from the previous uh, uh, slide I repeated uh, four times, or we repeated that question four times, and then you see that the hold rates among losers is strictly larger than the hold rate amongst winners, yeah, so this precisely indicates that individuals tend to hold on to losers more frequently than to winners, yeah, so this is a strong uh, indication for the disposition effect in the cross-section. And that's also in line with, with previous literature, especially with the finance literature, uh, where we find that uh, individual investors uh, are prone to a disposition effect. Yeah, and you also see that if we increase the standard deviation of the uh, underlying investments, then the disposition effect becomes increasing uh, or stronger. Okay. Then my uh, final uh, uh, table. So how does this look like uh, uh, in the time series? So as a dependent variable, I take uh, a hold. This is a dummy, whether you want to hold on to your investment or not, uh, uh, given that you had a loss or not. Yeah, so we repeat the um, finding from the previous slide here in model one. Uh, the dependent variable is holding on to your investment, given that you had a loss, 
we find a, a statistically significant positive effect. Yeah, so you hold on to losses more often than to gains. I also include a lot of controls, uh, age, uh, education, income. So this finding is quite robust. Secondly, in the, the second model, if I include returns on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, which is completely exogenous of our experiment, so therefore that's also interesting, we still find a strong disposition effect, but I also find that uh, uh, the disposition effect fluctuates with returns on the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. So if returns are positive, hold rates decrease. Yeah, so in uh, bust periods, participants tend to sell and in, uh, uh, or sorry, in boom periods, participants tend to sell and in bust periods, they tend to hold, which is uh, exactly in line with the disposition effect. And in model three, I also include these uh, weak dummies and you find that towards the end of the emergence of the COVID-19 crisis, the disposition effect is stronger than in the uh, weeks before. So then, uh, uh, I conclude. Um, so first of all, I find that, uh, 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 or we find that risk aversion decreases as a result of um, the uh, COVID-19 crisis and impatience increases. Yeah, so this is in line with the paper of Sasset uh, and the co-authors in Wuhan, with, but it contrasts some traditional papers in the finance literature. I also find that uh, trust in, uh, increases and we find a strong disposition effect, which is also not constant throughout time. Um, and that's in line with the paper of Bernard and their co-authors. So thank you. Um, and if there are any questions, then please feel free uh, to ask them. And then I give uh, the floor back to, uh, to John for, I guess, the discussion.